Change in the 1600s as Europeans were able to obtain a lucrative trade item, and that was furs. The fishermen who were trading on the coast were bringing back more and more furs. And the traditional sources of furs used by hat makers in Paris had been Russia and the Baltic area. But during time of warfare with those areas, when those regions were cut off, then Canada became more attractive. Europeans couldn't as easily dominate trade on the Baltic Sea, thanks to the rise of Peter the Great, the construction of St. Petersburg, so they turned elsewhere. There were about 250 French people living in the St. Lawrence Valley, which was, <coughs> there were about 250 French people living in the St. Lawrence Valley in 1641, a year before the founding of Montreal. And so, New France was a tiny, tiny colony, practically like a glorified moon base at that time, if you think about it that way, or a, or a slightly bigger version of the International Space Station today. About 50 French settlers arrived in Quebec City in 1641 to set the stage for the founding of Montreal the following year as a religious colony. Three boats arrived in 1642 at a point of land that would become the beginning of Montreal. This marked the beginning of French emigration to New France, what this region was called, but it was actually pretty short, from the early 1600s to the 1760s, about 150 years. And the population always remained small because unlike England, France didn't encourage settlement. Britain traded with its American colonies in high-weight, low-value items like lumber. British ships would leave the American colonies filled to the brim. But there was little trade in the other direction, and since there were a lot of trees to cut down and the need for a lot of manpower, there were many settlers that were sent to New England in what is today the United States in order to take advantage of this venture. But it was the opposite in French Canada, because French ships would arrive in Quebec that would carry low-value manufactured goods and leave with low-volume, high-value beaver pelts. You didn't need a lot of trappers to supply these high-value beaver pelts, unlike logging, which did require a lot more manpower. Too many settlers would get in the way, and if you had more settlers, this would result in illegal beaver pelt trading by the settlers, and it would get worse the more settlers there were. Up in Quebec also, you couldn't grow high-value crops like tobacco or cotton or sugarcane like you could in New England or in the Caribbean. Hey everyone, Scott here. We're going to take a very short break for a word from our sponsors. So by 1759, over this century or so of French colonization, Quebec had about 60,000 people. At the same time, in the American colonies, there were 4 million people. Most of the people living in Quebec were Canadian-born, and most of the people in America were foreign-born due to the high route of immigration. This is part of the reason why some have noted that French last names in Canada, like Trudeau, the last name of the current prime minister, Justin Trudeau, there are a small number of names, and they're not common if you go to France, from what I've heard. The ancestors of pretty much every French-speaking person in Quebec were these people who arrived in this narrow window of opportunity. In contrast, the population of France was in the range of 10 million or so. So Quebec was a small representation of what France was in this time period. During the colonial period, France was Europe's dominant power. Its population during the 18th century grew to about 20 to 25 million inhabitants, while that of the British Isles was only about 7 million. But even though France had a lot of colonies, like in New Canada, it was mainly a continental power on Europe during the 18th century. But Britain was setting up colonies in India, Africa, North America, and all across the globe in an international system of colonies. Another reason why France didn't send so many people is that France's religious minorities, like its Protestant Huguenots, mainly moved to Central Europe, while Britain saw that perhaps it was a little bit more efficient to send its religious minorities, like the Puritans, to North America. The Catholic Church didn't allow France's religious minorities to move to New France, so you don't see Huguenots moving there with official state support, but Britain was more than willing to let its Puritans go so there was official support of emigration. So between 1715 and 1763, the population of New France grew from 15,000 to about 70,000 inhabitants. So let's look at the final years of New France, the colony, and when this colony becomes absorbed by the British. 
This has to do with the Seven Years' War and eventually the Revolutionary War as well. Authorities in New France wanted to expel British traders and colonists from the Ohio Valley. They constructed fortifications to protect the area. George Washington, when he was a young man in his early 20s, I think he was 22, in 1754, he launched a surprise attack on a group of Canadian soldiers that were sleeping in the early morning hour. This was before the Seven Years' War or the French-Indian War, so there was no declaration of war between France and Britain. Washington was vilified in the French press as this assassin, and so for French people who knew of Washington from this early depiction were probably surprised decades later when he was the leader of the Continental Army, and some may have grumbled a little bit with the French-American military alliance, but that's neither here nor there. This eventually led to the worldwide Seven Years' War between France and Britain, where they were fighting amongst their colonies all over the world in the Caribbean, in North America, and elsewhere. In 1758, the British attacked New France by sea and took the French fort at Louisbourg. In 1759, the British forces defeated those of the French outside of Quebec City. Except for a few small islands of St. Pierre and Miquelon, located off the coast of Newfoundland, France gave all of its North American possessions to Great Britain through the Treaty of Paris in 1763. And they did this in order to gain the island of Guadalupe that was very lucrative for the sugarcane trading. So the British Royal Proclamation of 1763 renamed Canada as the province of Quebec. Now, France smarted over this for a long time, and that's probably why they supported America in the Revolutionary War, in order to get back at Britain and perhaps get some of its possessions back. So what happened to those French speakers who were in New France as colonists, who identified themselves as French colonists? Suddenly there's the flag of the British Empire over them, what do they make of this? Well, the British worried about their loyalty. And with the outbreak of the Revolutionary War with the British colonies in the South that grew into the Revolution, the British worried that the French-speaking Canadians might also support this growing rebellion. French-speaking Canadians were the vast majority of the population of Quebec, about 99% of the population, and British immigration wasn't going well. In order to secure the allegiance of these 90,000 French speakers, Governor James Murray and later Governor Guy Carleton promote a compromise between French-speaking Canadian subjects and newly arriving British subjects. They promoted the Quebec Act of 1774. The Quebec Act gave the people of Quebec a charter of rights and led to the official recognition of the French language and French culture. And this allowed French speakers, known as Canadiens, to maintain French civil law and it sanctioned freedom of religion basically saying that you can continue to practice a Roman Catholic religion. You're not going to be forcibly converted into Anglicanism. You can continue being Catholic and we'll give you that freedom. So some argue that this is one of the first cases in history of state-sanctioned freedom of religious practice. Now, the division between the French Canadians and the British did not go unnoticed by the Americans, and this led to several military actions. Interestingly enough, in 1775, Benedict Arnold, while he was still fighting for the Americans before he defected to the British a few years later, he proposed a plan to Congress in which he would rally the inhabitants, the French speakers, some who were still not happy being under British rule, rally them to the American flag, and then take Montreal and Quebec. Congress approved the plan, as did George Washington. But there were a few problems with this plan. On the face of it, it makes sense. Tell the French speakers, join us, fight against the British, you will have your complete and total independence. But there were things that happened in the run-up to the Revolutionary War that caused bad blood between the French-speaking inhabitants and the English-speaking Americans. One was that at the First Continental Congress, in an October 1774 broadside written by John Jay and addressed to the people of Great Britain, they invade against the French legal system and the Roman Catholic Church. The French-Canadian Roman Catholic clergy didn't forget this attack on their legal system and their religious system. They proceeded to lecture French Canadians from the pulpit against what they called the heresies of Protestantism in the 13 colonies. Canadians feared that American Protestants would try to convert them in the way that they had previously feared that the British would try to convert them to the Anglican Church. As British loyalists flooded into Quebec in 1784, the arrival of 10,000 loyalists 
messed up the political balance that the British were working hard to achieve. There was a huge number of English speakers, and they petitioned the government to be allowed to use the British legal system instead of the French one that they were used to in the American colonies. There was a creation of Upper and Lower Canada in 1791 that allowed loyalists to live under British laws and institutions, while the French-speaking population of Lower Canada could keep the French civil law and the Catholic religion. So now you have a mixture of English-speaking Canadians and French-speaking Canadians, and this is where the period of conflict and this period of dual identities begins. At the end of the 18th century, after the American Revolution, people of British origin made up about 12.5% of the total population of Canada. Most were loyalists that came after the American Revolution. But then in the 19th century, the source of the growing British population or English-speaking population came from immigration from Britain, especially Scotland and Ireland. About 17 million people left Britain in the 19th century, and 9% of these came to Canada. This included about 50,000 Irish between 1825 and 1829, then another 185,000 between 1830 and 1834, and about 200,000 during the potato famine of 1845 to 1849. Many Irish immigrants went to the United States, but about 20% settled in Quebec. At the end of the 19th century, during a period of Russia's pogroms against its Jewish population, the predominantly Irish immigration was replaced by Eastern European Jews and also Italians. The Jewish population in Quebec went from 1.5% in 1901 to 5.7% in 1941. And the Italian population went from half a percent in 1901 to 2.3% in 1941. So the dynamics that are affecting the immigration numbers that appear in, say, Ellis Island, the United States, are also affecting Quebec as well. And just to give you an idea of what immigration numbers are like today, according to the 2016 census, the most cited ethnic groups are Canadian, French, and Irish. And 13% would represent a racial minority. Black, Arab, and Latin Americans represent the largest communities. 79% of Quebec has French as its mother tongue, compared to 8.9% who report English. And there are still sizable Aboriginal groups in Quebec, including Algonquian, Inuit, and Iroquoian. About 2.3% of the province's population is Aboriginal. So let's look at the demographic makeup of Montreal and Quebec Now I want to talk about its cultural dimensions and how, to many people, Montreal and Canada in general was a beacon of freedom. Some of the earliest European arrivals to Montreal associated that land with open-mindedness and a festive ambiance. François-Xavier Charlevoix, who was one of the first historians of New France, wrote in 1721 in his journal of A Voyage Made in North America by Order of the King, The city of Montreal has a most pleasant quality. It is well-situated, well-established, and well-constructed. The beauty of its surroundings, areas, and vistas instills pleasure felt by all. And to highlight this, in Canada and Montreal, it was a haven for escaped slaves from the United States. Barry Sheehy wrote an article about this in the Montreal Gazette. And he notes that British North America allowed thousands of runaway slaves to seek refuge here in Montreal, There was a colony of escaped slaves established in St. Catharines in what's now Ontario under the leadership of Harriet Tubman. They founded the British Methodist Episcopal Church, which still exists today. And while it was a beacon of freedom to many, what's interesting is that Montreal was also equally accepting of Confederate exiles and operatives and even spies. A few blocks away from the British Methodist Episcopal Church, Salem Chapel, the Confederate Secret Service operated across from the Niagara and District Bank. Authorities knew about the Confederate Secret Service, and they also knew about Tubman's colony, and tacitly approved of both. In Upper Canada, there was a stronger support for the abolitionist movement, but as you moved east, there was also support for the Confederacy. And this juxtaposition really played out in Montreal, which at the time was Canada's center of business and banking during the American Civil War. Runaway slaves would serve as staff in hotels, even though the institution would cater to Confederate exiles and secret operatives. 
And the government knew about the Confederate Secret Service to use Canada as a base for blockade running, to get over the Union blockade so that the Confederacy could receive critical supplies for its war effort. 